All right. Um, first speaker is Ali Kohler. Uh, the title is there. Of course, I did another exhaustive interview with her in the hallway for over two and a half minutes. She was born, uh, you know, about her now, she was born in the north woods of Minnesota in the middle of northern nowhere. Uh, grew up there, formed her years there. She then went, did her undergraduate degree in Wisconsin on Lake Superior. Also, pretty much in the middle of nowhere, she said, um, in Northland College, where she did undergraduate biology and natural resources. Apparently, thinking northern middle of nowhere was something she needed to alter in her background, she then went to College Station, Texas, uh, for her master's degree in Texas, at Texas A&M in wildlife science. Wildlife science, right? Good. Um, and then from there, she decided to sort of get in the middle of the road and come to the middle of everywhere, which is Fort Collins, and where she's working on her. The plans there. So I asked her about an interesting fact about herself. She has an amazing fact about herself. When she was an undergraduate, apparently, yeah, for good reason, I'm sure, she was running around in this middle of nowhere in the woods, shining in ultraviolet light, and noticed pink flying objects going by. They were not flamingos. It turns out flying squirrels fluoresce pink. I mean, you like it, right? This was unknown to science. And so when they reported this, she and, and the advisor or the colleagues, uh, that particular fact has been picked up by over 100 um, various media outlets. She's been interviewed many times about the pink fluorescent flying school. You can imagine that makes a headline, right, for any kind of media person. So she's got lots of experience talking about pink and blue uh, But I don't think she's going to talk about that today. So, Allison, take it away. Thank you everyone for being here to learn about my research on spatiotemporal agent-based model explorations of white-tailed deer management. My name is Ali Kohler, and I wanted to start by asking, by a show of hands, how many people in here are hunters or come from a family of hunters or just know a bit about hunting? If you're comfortable sharing or if you have an opinion, a little bit. And are there anyone in here who would identify as being part of the group of um, like animal rights activists or anti-hunting? Again, just if you're comfortable sharing. Okay, so it's kind of a good split perhaps, and that really is how it is in reality. There's a lot of places that have these two polar groups um, that coexist with each other, and it's really hard finding a balance. So I wanted to start by posing a question. What do white-tailed deer and computer modeling have in common? White-tailed deer are arguably the most popular animal species in America, with the most intensely debated and polarizing management of all game species. Though once extirpated across most of the country due to overhunting and habitat loss, their numbers have now skyrocketed in distribution and abundance in the past several decades due to successful restoration activities, the removal of predators, and the fact that they can reproduce very rapidly. Overabundant deer populations can have negative impacts on vegetation through selective and excessive browsing, and deer are what we call selective browsers, where they choose certain species to eat and other ones to completely ignore. So you can imagine the cumulative impacts that that would have on a garden or a forest where certain species could just be wiped out and the overall community can be changed. And deer are also usually thought to have negative impacts on human health as they can increase the number of vehicle collisions, they can facilitate disease spread like Lyme disease, chronic wasting disease, and even COVID and they can cause crop depletion, which can impact food security. The number of deer-related conflicts have increased in recent years as humans and deer populations have expanded and grown across the country and closer in contact. And this concept of coupled natural human systems is also growing in popularity, and it's the concept of exploring the dynamic two-way interactions between humans and natural systems. And it's important to note that the word overabundance is a reflection of human values and perceptions and not biological thresholds. Where biological carrying capacity is the number of deer that a parcel can accommodate or the amount of resources in an area that can sustain a certain number of deer. But cultural carrying capacity is a reflection of human sensitivity to deer and it's a factor of the number of deer that can coexist with people in an area. So the different stakeholders that may be involved in all of this are 
um, wildlife agencies, local governments, interest groups like hunters and animal rights activists, and the general public, just to name a few. And in recent years, stakeholders have sought greater involvement in wildlife management, tasking agencies with balancing complex and conflicting community interests. I want to bring up this current hot topic in deer research, which is their role in SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID-19. For a lot of people, this has been a growing cause of concern recently, and there's been a lot of research interest and funding going into figuring out what exactly is going on between deer and SARS. It's the consensus right now that humans have transferred SARS to deer at least six times across the country in different locations. And last month, maybe you've heard, we even had our first case of deer back to human transmission in Canada. And the problem is that deer can be a viral reservoir for different variants of SARS. And then after the human population has thought that we've had these viruses under control or eliminated, then maybe the deer would reintroduce them later on when we're not expecting it. And the other concern is that variants may mutate into deer population and then later introduce a stronger and more unmanageable strain. And a lot of research about this is popping up right now almost daily, with some studies citing the prevalence of COVID in their deer populations to be just a small percent, and others saying that 100% of their sampled deer populations either had COVID at the time of sampling, or they had the antibodies for it, so they recently had it. And deer don't show symptoms like people do. They're really not affected at all. But we do know that SARS transmits really rapidly through deer populations because they're really social animals. They'll say hello by bumping noses with each other, and you can just see the ease of transmission through this pathway that could occur right there. So whether SARS is going to be around for a while or whether it fades out sometime soon, this research will still be relevant because I can simply plug in numbers of other zoonoses or animal viruses that may pop up. So in my models, I would just change like the prevalence rate and the transmission rate, and I would create whole new models just by changing a few different and in addition to that, a lot of this research is happening right down the road at the National Wildlife Research Center. So I thought that it would be a good opportunity for some local collaboration. And my next slide does show a picture of a harvested dead deer. So if that's something you're sensitive to, you can look over that. To combat unwanted impacts resulting from overabundant deer populations, communities tend to reduce deer numbers by restoring ecological balances, like reintroducing predators such as wolves, by using a variety of non-lethal techniques like fertility control or relocation, or but most commonly by using uh, lethal methods like hunting and shark shooting. And predator, predator reintroduction is a super complex topic on its own, and I'm not gonna be focusing on that for this research. But communities tend to choose non-lethal methods when there are firearm restrictions or safety concerns, or if there's a large presence of activists in the community. And the places that do choose non-lethal methods tend to switch over to lethal ones after just a few months or a few years sometimes because they either find them ineffective or too expensive. And I'm gonna be focusing on five distinct management strategies that are present in my study area, which are controlled traditional hunts, controlled bow hunts, sharpshooting, fertility control, and lack of harvest. So controlled hunts are different from recreational hunting, the normal kind of hunting that we think of, in that controlled hunts are usually less restrictive in terms of things like hunter density, time allotment, weapons use, huntable area, or something like that. And controlled traditional hunts refer to this controlled hunting in traditional hunting seasons, where hunters can use bows, guns, or primitive weapons like muscle others. And controlled bow hunts are basically the same thing, but hunters can only use bows, and this is usually in areas where there's a higher human density. And sharpshooting refers to when um, trained volunteers or higher professionals come in and target certain deer or groups of deer, and they call the population in that way, usually with guns. And fertility control is any method that inhibits the successful reproduction of deer. And that can be a variety of things like surgical sterilization, where you actually go into the field and do surgery on the deer, 
super labor intensive, takes a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, other methods are you can start the deer with synthetic hormones and inoculate them in that way. So the the plus side of these methods is that there's the it's it's usually in places where there's a lot of activists, so there's seemingly um, you know not as much death involved. You can just save the deer, but there's actually a pretty high mortality rate associated with a lot of these methods. Um, one study suggested that said there's a 70% mortality rate with relocating deer, 70% chance that they will die in their new location. And one study in 2002 said that it was $387 a year to relocate them. So today that'd be about $600 a year. So it adds up quick, and it's hard for a lot of places to justify the input costs when it may not even pay off. Um, but these are just some of the things that people consider when they are thinking about um, implementing these different management strategies. And sometimes if you're in a really densely populated area, these fertility control methods are maybe the only option that we have. Um, so if you look away for the last time, you can look back now. And I'm going to be focusing on strategically selected towns in New York and Massachusetts, balancing both urban and rural settings and management strategies when possible. In New York, you are governed by the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, and in Massachusetts, it's the Massachusetts Division of Fish and Wildlife. And in addition to these agencies, deer can be governed beyond a state level and to that of a city, town, or village level, it's villages in New York. And municipalities usually have different management goals simply because communities are different. And this can result in inefficient resource use and minimal progress being made by either management group, sometimes resulting in a zero-sum game where deer populations are ultimately unchanged. And, I mean, you can imagine this number is just really hard to agree on in the first place and to identify, so there's that as well. So imagine that you love deer and you put feet out for them in your backyard. But your neighbor thinks that deer are really overpopulated and takes every chance that they can to legally shoot any deer that crosses from your property onto theirs. So scale that up from a backyard level to a town level. And that's exactly what is happening here. Communities have different views on what the optimal number of deer should be. And towns are free to independently manage those local deer according to those beliefs and perceptions. And this results in a disjointed, asynchronous, constantly fluctuating deer management landscape. So for this research, the problem is that deer management is often disjointed between stakeholder parties, and little is known about how the spatio-temporal aspects of these municipal asynchronies is ultimately impacting deer and people on a local scale. And this problem is vital to investigate today so that we can better understand how our management decisions are influencing communities, so we can reconsider the best allocation of resources to meet both ecological and social goals. So my study question is, how does this disjointed deer management landscape impact the people and deer of these communities? And I will investigate these impacts through spatially explicit and implicit models that will provide insights for management theory and provide management recommendations to towns in the study area. So I mentioned spatially explicit and implicit. So spatially explicit models have defined spatial relationships between landscape features. Or in other words, they are places with explicitly expressed features in specific locations. And spatially implicit models don't focus on the specifics, but they work around general areas that have implied features. And this will make a lot more sense when I show you a few examples. Individual objectives of this research are to create two research models per town, one spatially explicit and one spatially implicit, and to create two additional research, I mean, teaching and learning tools per town, which are much more simplified versions compared to the research models. And I'd like to provide management recommendations to the towns in the study area. And I'd like to address management theory with my results. And I'd also like to create a framework that other researchers can use to aid in their management of this species or a different species in the same area or another area. 
Models are simplifications of the world, and simulation models capture an aspect of a system that we can then experiment on to answer research questions. And agents are another part of a model, and they are individual units that are capable of autonomous actions in an environment that are driven by design objectives. So whatever the system is that you're working with, agents are the smallest unit that makes sense for that system. So say your system is a hospital, maybe your agents would be people. Or if your system is a petri dish, maybe your agents would be cells. And in my case, the system is the deer management landscape and my agents are deer. Agents can represent variability by belonging to different groups with unique characteristics, like a male deer or a female deer, and by expressing traits and behaviors to different degrees, like a deer that eats a lot and one that eats a little. And agent-based models are a unique class of computational dynamic models that are classified by actions and interactions of agents and their environments that produce these emergent patterns over time. And this concept of emergence is just what it sounds like. It's something that emerges from your models that maybe you expected or maybe it surprised you and it's something new that you weren't expecting. The emergence that results from programming at this individual level is classified as bottom-up modeling. I'm sure a lot of us in here are familiar with the concept of bottom-up versus top-down control and like trophic cascading ecology. So similarly, when we represent heterogeneity among individuals and their environments, these micro-level interactions result in system-level outcomes. And that is the heart of agent-based modeling. I'm going to be using NetLogo for my research, which is a simple yet powerful platform with a built-in graphical interface that's so super user-friendly, and it has comprehensive documentation. So my spatially explicit models are going to be specific to my study areas in New York and Massachusetts. And I'm going to be using a variety of local data to um, program these models, including vehicle collision and harvest data, and prism weather data, national land cover data, and a lot of information from our various surveys that we're doing. And the purpose of these spatially explicit models is to figure out exactly what's going on between deer and people in these specific communities, in these towns, so that we can provide practical real world management recommendations for these towns. And I wanted to take a second to show you guys how that logo how it works. Has anyone in here used NetLogo before? Okay, a little bit. Um, yeah, so here this is a model showing chronic wasting disease spreading through a deer population in Michigan. And this is a spatially explicit model because you can see this is a real place. It's Eaton County, Michigan, where these uh, the black represents structures or buildings and the green is some um, vegetation scale that they have. So this is a real place. The features on the landscape are explicit, they're expressed to those locations. And don't worry about all these um, different controls here, but the point is just that there's so many different things that you can program into it and control, and it's super customizable. You can, you can make it anything you want it to be. And so when I press go there, it's a little glitchy, there's a lot of information in this model. But it randomly chose a patch to infect a deer with CWD, and then it examines how it may spread across this landscape through space and time. And then there's some different monitors and graphs and like a CWD um, prevalence tracker over there. And there's also a tab for information, so you can write in all the details for other people to use it, so it's as clear as possible. And then there's a coding tab with all the code. It's kind of like R, a um, lot of stuff in this model. But yeah, so you'd run that over and over until you would get um, some patterns to emerge. And I wanted to include this flow diagram here, which shows the basic layout of the model, starting with some of the data sources that I'll use, like um, from the literature, our different surveys, like drought survey, pellet survey, camera trap survey, we're doing that as well, and some of the different parameters that that information will program, like the initial population parameters. So what does the deer population look like in the beginning? How many deer are there? 
what are the sex and age ratios, that kind of a thing, and the different uh, management strategies that there are to choose from, and the different processes that it would affect, like environmental processes, management processes, and the gear themselves, which are the focal unit, the agents of the models, and some of the different things that I'd be interested in looking at. So there's deer population characteristics, like mortality rate, metapopulation structure, um, really anything like that, and how vehicle collisions may change under different management scenarios, um, how the amount of land available to management may play a role, how rural versus suburban areas may be different. Yeah, a variety of things. And this is just kind of a snapshot of what I'm thinking. So the spatially implicit models are not constrained to a specific location, but rather they are extreme simplifications of the spatially explicit models. And the purpose of this is to try and get at the underlying mechanisms of the system so that we can address management theory. And I'm going to be working with three spatial scales seen in part A of this figure, where scale one represents a single township level. And scale two is a single town with one layer of surrounding towns. And scale three is one central town with two layers of surrounding towns. And for simplicity, all the towns have the same area. So spatial scale one is focusing on understanding the dynamics within a single town, where scales two and three will seek to answer the broader question of how different neighboring municipalities and their management strategies are influencing each other. And part B of this figure shows an example of spatial scale three, where the central town has fertility control as a management strategy, and 50% of the surrounding towns are populated with that same management strategy, randomly generated. And then the remaining 50% of the towns will have a management strategy randomly assigned to them that's different than the one in the central town. And then this would be ran over and over until we start to get some patterns emerging at the different um, thresholds. So I forgot to mention that. So over here, I imagine testing what I'm calling similarity thresholds, where either 0, 25, 50, 75, or 100% of the surrounding towns would have the same management strategy as the central town. And the purpose of this would be to identify what level of coordination is needed to make impactful changes to local deer populations. And so here's an example of what my NetLogo interface will look like for my models. Um, I don't have it working yet, so I just took a screenshot. But you can see there is people and deer across the landscape. And this is obviously the spatially implicit model and some different um, like monitors to look at the number of antler deer, antler lists, controlling the amount of rural land that's present, some different population tracker graphs, looking at birth rate, death rate, all of that. And again, super customizable. Anything that you'd be interested in looking at, you can just add a graph to it or add a monitor, and you can keep track of anything going on. And then you'll also have a time scale, and you can set it to run for you know 10 years, 20 years, whatever whatever you're interested in. And so spatially implicit has implied features and spatially explicit has expressed landscape features. So here in the spatially implicit model, it's implied that there's trees and buildings and everything that a normal town would have in these towns. But that's not relevant to the questions that I'm asking for this model, so I didn't include them. I'm just trying to isolate the one independent variable that I'm interested in, which is the management and how that um, controls the system. And so the spatially explicit model will be a little bit different. It'll be pretty similar to the chronic wasting disease model that I showed you, where it's an actual place. There's going to be buildings and trees, and that correlates to these towns because I'm interested in what the dynamics are like in these specific areas. I'm proposing five different chapters for this research with the intent of publishing the middle three. And the first one would be the introduction. I would just lay out the, um, the question, the research problem, and it'd just be a foundation for the chapters to come. And chapter two would be about the spatially explicit versus implicit models and how different management scenarios affect the dynamics of this complex landscape. And I'd also include the framework for other researchers in that chapter. And the
the third chapter would be about how the amount of land that's available to deer management plays a role in the outcomes. And so that is something that towns can manipulate. They can open certain parks or areas or homeowners can open their land to hunters. So this is something that they can manipulate and um, it's you know possible to actually do in the real world. So I thought that it would be a good idea to designate a chapter to exploring some of the thresholds involved with that. And chapter four would be about how SARS dynamics may change through space and time in general in the implicit model and then also in these specific towns that I'm working with. And then the last chapter would just be the summary conclusion implications. So in summary, I would like to research how asynchronous deer management is impacting deer and people. I'd like to know at what level, what level of coordination is needed to make impactful changes to local deer populations. To answer these questions, I will use a variety of data from local sources like local agencies, the literature, and a lot from my fieldwork. And the products of this research will be research models, educational models, um, management recommendations to the towns in the study area, insights for management theory, and also a framework for other researchers to use in their management. And I'd like to convey this research in five chapters, with the middle three being about spatially explicit versus implicit models, and about how the land available to management plays a role, and how SARS dynamics may change their space and time. So what do white-tailed deer and computer modeling have in common? Well, maybe not a lot. In fact, maybe nothing at all. But when we put these two totally opposite things together, we can create something new that can make the world a better place in a small way, like combining rock pigments and oil to make an artist paint, or bread and mold to create penicillin. But in the end, I just hope that this research will simply expand our understanding of the deer management systems in place so that we can learn how to sustain healthy, long-lasting relationships here and the communities that they share them with. And with that, I would like to thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions or answer answer any questions or take any comments or suggestions for improvement. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else? Yes. <laughs> well, I'll certainly start. Nice job, Allie. So this whole idea of um, local control, right? I mean, that, that, that isn't true of all states, or at least it's not true of all policy states, right? We have, we have policy in states and different cities and towns that don't have local control over it. And I'm sure some do. In, any sense on, is this typical of like, is this typical of wildlife management in most states, or is this unique to Massachusetts and New York? Yeah, you know, I'm not exactly sure about that. I especially don't know beyond deer, but I think, so why we're looking at New York and Massachusetts is because deer are such a problem over there. There's a lot of people, really dense populations, and you can't have these more simple management strategies of just like hunting in rural areas. So you have these deer that go congregate in these um, places where there's a lot of people and they get really overpopulated, so nobody's hunting them. So I think that it may be different in kind of these areas where you just have a lot of people, a lot of strong opinions and people who want to get involved and who are interacting with wildlife on a daily basis. But I'm not sure how much that expands beyond these areas, but that is a really good question. And the there's no emission yeah. regulations. Yeah. You, don't, you don't have cities normally have emission Exactly. I wonder what you gave so much history is the one time it was one state yeah. where there was more local or just yeah, like exactly. socio ecological like this is bad. Yeah, that's something I would definitely be looking into. Yes. Do you do you have plans to like like ground truth what your findings are from these models? Like verify them kind of thing? Yeah. So that's kind of the point of the, the well, field work that we're doing with the um, camera trap surveys and drought surveys and health surveys and all that. And we're even doing um, human surveys for their perceptions of local deer. And so
so it's called model validation and verification where we'll use that real world data to program the model but then also to verify it to make sure that it's coming out like how it actually is in the real world. So we will be using that local data to verify and validate the models now. Yes? I was curious about maybe um, related to Alan's question. Statewide rules would make sense, maybe in national forests, but when it's all like rural private land, the Indians guide yeah. manages their by you know by individual parcels and it's like it's so complex. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely part of it. It's, I mean, I think there's a lot less public land in a lot of those areas, but that's um, part of you know what we'll be looking at is kind of having these theoretic thresholds of judging the amount of. Urban versus rural, and I can look at public versus private land and see what thresholds and patterns will emerge across these theoretical three 